two. So I think we're now ready to begin. So very warm welcome to everyone um, for this um, webinar, Beauty Strikes Back. Um, I'm Samuel Hughes, I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford. Recent years have seen a lot of evolution in the urbanist movement. Um, this goes back, I mean, in some ways to postmodernism and new urbanism and the traditional architecture revival in the 1980s, but it continues to change um, in different ways in different places. Today, we've got some of the most interesting um, urbanists around the world gathered to talk. Um, Nadia Evera from La Rontetable de l'Architecture in Belgium, Kobe Lefkowitz from Backyard in the USA, Millie May from the Street Level Australia, which is indeed in Australia, Nicholas Boy Smith from Great Streets in the UK, and Ruben Hansen from the Aesthetic City in the Netherlands. Um, I'm going to be a fairly liberal chair, um, so we will have plenty of opportunity for the discussion to meander, uh, but we're going to have a strict end at 1.45. Um, everyone apart from the speakers is muted, but if you have questions, please do put them in the chat and we will discuss them um, later in the session. Uh, so, And you can put the questions in any time, even right, right now, if you've decided in advance what you want to ask, um, and then we'll get back to them um, when we can. Um, I think we'll start just very briefly with introductions um, from each of the participants. So um, just two minutes, who you are, um, and a little bit about your work and your organization. Um, shall we start with, with Millie? Let's do it, thank you. Thanks for having us, everyone. So um, Street Level, we're a chapter-based membership organization. So we're very grassroots and we've got chapters around Australia. Um, and we were founded because um, of the premise that we think the built environment is a primary root cause of social distress and fragmentation um, with all the, the domino effects that entails. So I just noticed that a lot of spending was happening in the area of services on stuff like loneliness. And I thought, let's solve the root cause. Um, so we're trying to rebalance the power equation in favor of what lay people want, which it turns out is beauty. Um, and we think, you know, executives and trustees and people who are important and fancy should be able to sit around a board table and talk about beauty without feeling embarrassed um, because it's so essential and so important for um, human flourishing and we all yearn for it. So we focus on um, traditional urbanism and architecture because the outcomes are so good and desirable, but that's us. Thank you very much. Um, Kobe. Hi everyone, uh, Nicholas Constance, thank you so much for, for having me as a part of this wonderful panel. Uh, and Samuel for moderating. Um, I, my name is Kobe Lefkowitz. I'm a developer based in, in the US, uh, predominantly doing work in Southern California, though based in, in New York. A lot of my work is centralized around inspiring some uh, optimistic belief that there is a potential to create uh, great new architecture, to create great new cities, uh, revitalize our existing cities in some way uh, that uh, the philosophy has, has been lost in, in the States. There's a prevailing cynicism or, or, or lack of belief um, either way you go that uh, we've somehow lost the ability to create these wonderful places. Americans will travel around the world, uh, maybe perhaps travel to, to New York or, or Boston or, or Santa Barbara or select places in pursuit of wonderful, attractive built environments uh, and see no cognitive dissonance that um, the places in which they live uh, should have any uh, should not have those same elements uh, which they seek out. Um, and so a lot of my work through writing and then through effectuating it in, in our developments is to uh, inspire some hope that it is possible to create great places of new agnostic of style, uh, fundamental good urban design is, is what we try to effectuate. Um, and, and hopefully in our small way, both in, in our backyard and, and everyone else's, we can we can work towards creating a more wonderful, uh, equitable world. Mm -hmm. um, Nadia. Yes, hello. And yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Constance, Nicolas, and Samuel for organizing this great discussion. Um, so I'm representing La Table Ronde de l'Architecture, the Round Table of Architecture, which is a Belgian-based nonprofit association uh, based in Bruges, a beautiful city. Uh, if you haven't visited, I really push you to come here. Yes, you should. I've been. It's marvelous. <laughs> yeah, it's truly really beautiful. It's nearly perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And so the association defend and teach um, a more human, 
um, and durable architecture. So beauty is inherent to that. Um, so we guide, let's say we, we guide to make beauty um, through um, education and then through workshop with um, local authorities or uh, local associations. So we help them to bring projects, counter projects. So if there is a problem in the locality, we try to find solution. Uh, when I say guide, we do guide, we, we create guides, so we draw and we write um, something that Great Street also do, um, and it's something very new for us that we start in France, um, so trying to find, you know, the, the principles, the, the fundamental principles that rules um, good and beautiful architecture, urban planning, making beautiful space and happy people. Um, and so the other part of our work is education. And so we do a summer school um, of architecture. And next year, we will start another summer school of crafts. So that's a, um, a really exciting project for us. And we do courses. Um, we also have lots of um, volunteers and interns that we help, we guide students in Belgium and France. So it's mostly the, spe the, the French speaking world. Um, we help through their education um, because if they are unhappy to find ways that, you know, they can continue to pursue their uh, architecture education um, without leaving it um, and still loving it. So, yes. Um, Nicholas. Thank you, Samuel. And thank you, Nadia, Millie, Kobe and Ruben for joining us. Um, so I went mad. <laughs> about 10 years ago and and gave up uh, my previous career uh, first as a strategy consultant and then as as a banker because I started to get I, I recognize a lot of what Millie and, uh, and Nadia and Kobe are saying started to get increasingly frustrated with what I saw happening you know to my I was gonna say hometown that's probably not the right way my home city which is which is London and specifically I live in in, in South London and uh, quite close to the Thames um, and I, I can't quite remember how I had the to how it happened but I, I ended up managing to spend a few hours with some Eritrean and Somali mothers on a uh, post-war estate in South London that was being redeveloped and my sort of Inca hate thoughts about how cities should look and be and how they should work which I had been nervous I think rightly nervous we were, were essentially you know, just mine and not, not necessarily things that were shared more widely um, when I listen to them speaking and you know using slightly different words but essentially saying exactly what i'd been in intuitively thinking and then as i started doing research and looking a little bit at where people are happy and where they like to be i i began to realize just how common some of these themes are so to, to find the answer to samuel's question if you like that gave me the courage to, to give up my job and set up great streets which is a london-based uh, social enterprise uh, and we also have an associated charity a not-for-profit the great streets foundation and we do three things, so hopefully before too long, we will be doing four things. I mean, at, at our heart, like I say, so our, our vision and our aim is to help, you know, make the case for, develop and steward beautiful and popular gentle density places, by which we mean not, you know, that sweet spot, not too isolated, not too hyper dense, uh, which residents and neighbours can, can love for generations. And we set that as for the reasons of, for people, prosperity and planet. And we see those aims of sustainability, prosperity, and individual and personal well-being as, as very strictly associated. Um, uh, and to do that, but at our heart, we do research. And uh, Nadia touched on this. And I, I have brought with me, I have here, no, I promise you there are words in them, you know, some, of the, some of the things we've published. So we've done you know, book-length studies and, and, and various policy reports into the types of places people like and why, trying to be quite empirical about it. And I, I initially was quite nervous about the word beauty because I thought it would trigger lots of... Um, you know, non-empirical responses, but but actually there is something there in how places look that I, I think it's hard to use any other word for. But to some degree, you can break down what the, the reasons are. So we do research, uh, we do support to uh, neighbourhood groups, community groups, uh, developers and investors and, and local government, uh, you know, to try to help them make them do it and, and, and achieve better places. Uh, we advocate for change. There are all sorts of issues in the aims and tactics of planning here in England, which uh, certainly were very non-ideal 10 years ago. And I think they're actually getting better in a good way, but there's still lots of work to do. And then finally, and I think very much actually inspired by looking at the work of, of Nadia and Ruben and others, as we start to change the system a little bit in, in, in England, I think we begin to realise actually the huge paucity of skills 
uh, in the design and development sector. So we're just beginning to dip our toe very carefully, and I'm, you know, I'm not an architect by background, into the into the education sector. We ran our very first. Uh, because there's now someone at the door and the dog's going bananas. And if I mute myself, I can't unmute myself. What the hell? Um, we're just beginning to you know, dip, dip our toe into that. So we ran our first drawing course uh, literally two weekends ago. And we're hoping to run, uh, start running summer courses in northern England in left behind bits of Yorkshire and elsewhere uh, ne next summer. That's it. Sorry, that's more than two minutes. I'll stop there. Thank you, Nicholas. And last but not least, uh, Ruben. Thank you, um, Samuel. And of course, uh, thank you, Nicholas and uh, Constance for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to be part of this. Uh, I'm Ruben Hansen. I'm based in Amsterdam. And um, yeah, I'm the founder of The Aesthetic City. So my background is in urban planning and urbanism. And I started uh, The Aesthetic City because I felt that something crucial was missing from the discourse about cities and uh, or actually a whole class of crucial factors. And the most important of which is, yeah, of course, beauty. And yeah, beauty is, of course, a bit of a, a tough subject because it's always seen as something so, um, yeah, subjective. But um, yeah, I grew frustrated with what I saw happening uh, in modern cities and at uh, home, of course, in a lot of cities here in the Netherlands. So I thought about what I could do about it. So um, I looked around what was happening in this field. And um, I, I also discovered this whole field of different thinkers uh, than I was used to, to reading and seeing in university and later. So um, uh, I saw that there was still a gap and the gap was a podcast, uh, for example. So yeah. Um, uh, I basically started the Aesthetic City uh, to focus on this podcast and it grew from there. And um, yeah, so now I make a lot of content about the topic of how or, how to make our cities beautiful and livable uh, aimed at a wide audience uh, because I feel, yeah, this is really uh, something that wasn't really happening enough in my opinion. And I'm doing this in order to uh, hopefully achieve a shift of, of mindset because, uh, or perhaps even a broader paradigm shift which is, of course, uh, can only happen with a, when a lot of people join and, uh, well, start saying the same things. Um, because I think that, uh, yeah, the power of ideas is that uh, they can influence politicians, administ uh, administrators, activist groups and professionals. And at some point, it will trickle down all the way to, well, developers, individual uh, uh, builders and, uh, well, our built environment itself. So... Uh, I hope with my podcast and with guests like Robert Adam and uh, funny enough, most of the people on this panel actually have already been on the podcast, uh, except for Matt Nadia. So uh, still, I hope to get you on the podcast soon. And now also, also a YouTube channel to to grow as rapidly as I can and also to, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, to start uh, spreading these ideas, which I think are... Um, yeah, way overdue to being implemented in our society. So, uh, yeah, that's me. And um, I suppose I mean the obvious place to ask is uh, the obvious place to start is I mean, here in the UK. There's been quite a lot of change in the last five or ten years. I think in the way public debate about these issues plays out. Um, Famously, someone looked up in Hansard the record of all debates in the House uh, in the Houses of Parliament, whether the term beauty had been used in connection with architecture or planning or urban design, and nobody had used it in any parliamentary debate since the 1940s, I think. But now they use it all the time, and it's you know kind of a received part of British political discourse. And that that's partly due to Nicholas's work, although partly due to a the work of many other people working. So I, I wonder, maybe maybe starting with Nicholas, what what would you say the key points you would make are about how how to make the case for beautiful placemaking for good urbanism? You know, how have how have you reframed some of this discussion over the last few years to give it much more impact and much more much more cut through? Gosh. Um... And I didn't know that fact about Hansard. I'm sure you said famously as if everyone in the UK knew that. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. Uh, I mean, I'm, so, I'm so pleased we are on this panel. I wouldn't know that otherwise. I assume that's true. You're not just making that up for rhetorical effect. <laughs> we were told during the Building Beautiful Commission. Yeah. I, I, I've forgotten that. Um, uh, maybe I wasn't there that day. Um, so, I, I, I think it's a mixture of um, you know, good luck and intent. So, you know, and, and sometimes you need to not be an expert, and this is not an anti-expert thing, we need our experts in the built environment, but to some degree, sometimes you need to come 
in at 45 degrees to see something that others have sort of slightly lost sight of. Um, and so I think it was it was being very, very clear uh, and coming at, you know, as a, sort of, as a former strategy consultant, you know, very much trying to find evidence for clients. Um, but golly, there is lots of research out there as to what people like and where they're healthy and where they will meet neighbours and where they tend to feel more at home in the world. And although it's it's not that no planners or architects are aware of any of that, but they were aware of quite a few bits of it, it, it is not systematically influencing planning policy. And even more so, it is not influencing the if you like the, polit- the necessarily political debate that you like goes over the planning policy and right and rightly so because we live in democracy, um, and that in consequence the view that um, you know one man's meat is another man's poison, all design is subjective, essentially is just assumed to be true in the political debate centre right hand centre left. So I think the key point was that that needed to be undermined. There is such a thing as good design. It, it is, and, and there is quite a high level of predictability in where people are happier and more prosperous and what they're going to tend to support. And so I think it was coming in as that. And then I think doing something that, you know, I think it'd be very hard for most architects to do, you know, just because they've been told they, sh- they shouldn't and they mustn't, which is doing what we call visual preference surveys and actually starting to uh, try and understand what it is that what people like and then trying to break that down. And once you start you know, talking in terms of what people like, particularly if you can then link it to wider evidence on health and well-being and sustainability, you're talking to politicians as well as to if you like, functionaries and, and policymakers. So, so I think that was the, 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 the key thing. Um, and then I think to some degree we perhaps got lucky, which is we, because I didn't know this, was, I, how could I know when we started, actually by talking about these things, we almost unearthed this huge wellspring of desire to talk about this and to care about it and to feel legitimized to do it. And the number of people who've got out, reached out to either me or Create Streets more widely over the years and said, so sort of, thank you for sort of allowing us to talk about this and allowing us to care and not feel silly for saying it. And so, sort of, th- th- so I think there's just a, there was just a lot of pent up innate desire. I think Millie was sort of touching on this. I see Millie's nodding. So I'll turn over to her in a second. So, so I, I think it was that combination of, I think, an insight to how to do it. And then good luck in the sense that we, we did open up this pot that was important and hadn't been open for many years. Yeah, mm. and we use the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission's report all the time. We send it to policymakers here because Australians still feel quite, you know, um, <laughs> we respect our uh, former colonial uh, masters, but it's just been so useful for us to be able to send it to governments and say, look what the UK is doing. So thank you for that. Um, but I wanted to riff off something Nicholas said because he mentioned consistency, and I've been thinking about this a lot. Because one of the things that um, started us in street level was the equity of beauty. Because I would walk through the leafy streets that um, affluent people live in and compare them to the the dross that, um, you know, the average punter gets. And I just think it's, you know, we've got a problem with consistency and predictability and the universality of something that should, that, you know, used to be more accessible. Um, and so I think we went way too far in the direction of the designers, the creative genius, and we all, you know, expect something new and creative and different and amazing every time. Um, and urban design and architecture got really compromised by that relativism and by that idea of the, you know, romantic creative genius. So you have this 5% that's amazing and then 95% of it that's unremarkable. We call it dishwasher architecture and the urbanism as well, um, you know, is bad too. And so um, so by default, you get a vacuum. And what fills the vacuum? Well, engineers, traffic engineers and developers. And, you know, that all has its place. But should they be designing, you know, communities and doing the urban design? I don't think so. And for me, that's why we focus on the traditional language, right? People think that we're um, trying to bring back historical styles and bring back, you know, um, and replicate and recreate the past. And it's not what we're doing at all. Um, The traditional language is like the musical scales. So people think that what we're trying to do is get people to, you know, constantly replay symphony number nine, but we're not. We're trying to get people to learn the scales again and bring that predictability back and use the materials they used to use so that we can get consistency. I want to ask, so it's fascinating. I want to ask, which you can probably comment on, Millie, but I maybe we'll go first to um, to Kobe. In Europe, we'll often, you know, when we're talking about these things, we'll often make an appeal to the idea of like, of a vernacular. I know Nicholas does that all the time. Uh, Ruben and I were just talking about this a couple of weeks ago, that uh, you know, in Amsterdam, you can talk about the Amsterdam vernacular, which is a very recognizable urban type 
that runs from the well, I suppose from the end of the Middle Ages right up until the 1930s, and in some ways even beyond that. And that's very familiar, that has authority. People don't feel that's weird or that that's like something from another place that's being imported. Is this harder in urban environments where you have less of a dense historic vernacular like that to work from? Is it more difficult to make the case? For, so obviously, I mean, you live in New York, Toby, you've got an ama amazing vernacular fabric to work with, but you've worked all across the United States, including in places where that maybe is less true. Am I well, I, what are your thoughts I, would be I, on that? I, I think uh, if I were to impose the New York vernacular on everywhere else in America, there'd be a lot of uh, anger and, and fear. <laughs> right. uh, so I, I, I often can't speak from that perspective. Um, I think the difficulty in, in the US is that, uh, uh, not unlike uh, places around the world, um, that much of our vernacular was either destroyed or relegated to a secondary status. And it, it's only in the last 10 or 20 years come to be appreciated for, uh, for I think the, the, the beauty and, and the value that, that we would all agree that it has. Most Americans and, and most North Americans, it might indeed extend to Australia, view our vernacular as sort of this um, cutesy, uh, colonial, uh, traditional single family home detached with a half acre of land, a couple of parking spaces, a driveway. And, uh, and so we don't uh, look to vernacular as something that's fundamentally urban or, or tradition of that. Right. Uh, we look to it as, as suburban. And I, I think often when making the arguments that, that all of us on, on this panel make, and I think um, you know, all, all who have joined us today who may be watching might be sympathetic to, uh, we can't argue from a historical perspective because it's, you know, in, in America, uh, in North America as well, we are, are very focused on progressing forward. Um, and, and there's less of a, a language and, and an understanding that the past is something that, uh, that can propel us forward. It seemed as, oh, okay, that's another era. It was wonderful that we once built that way. It's just not what we do anymore. And in many senses, our work is of creating a new vernacular. Um, that looks very different if you're in New England versus the Mid-Atlantic, Southeast, the, the West, uh, Pacific Northwest, certainly. And so it's, it's very highly regional in a way that certainly exists in other countries, but the, the U.S. being as large as it is, uh, it's a much different project. And so what I've found success in is less saying, isn't it lovely if we had these 20-story New York uh, mid-rises that, <laughs> that we could plop down everywhere. Uh, it, and certainly I kind of take away my mask of New Yorkness and say, well, look at this lovely building if I'm talking to folks in West Virginia that was just built in Huntington. Look at this wonderful new complex that was built um, in Oklahoma City, depending where you are. And that's a language that people can understand. Uh, now, it, it was said before, I certainly said, no, I think by you, that we, we stand on, on the shoulders of, of, of those who have done the work of the past and it allows us to do it easier to make those arguments. Uh, and so that every, every day our work becomes a little bit easier because those understand it, but, but 20 or 30 years ago, there, there weren't really these conversations at a national scale and people didn't have precedent they could look to, which allowed them to very easily fall back into the North American vernacular of detached single family homes um, and kind of look with derision and, and anxiety at anything that came from, from the city. Um, Ruben's just pointed out to me, which I think is great. I, we've got some hands going up in the audience. Now I am powerless to unmute members of the audience. So what you have to do if you have questions is put them in the chat and then I will ask them on your behalf to the panel a little bit later. We're very, very keen to take audience contributions, but it's just uh, for, for reasons that are beyond me, technically impossible for me to let you speak directly. Um, I think, um, yes, Kobe, fascinating point was something I was going to bring up. I mean, how how the situation has changed for this generation relative to preceding ones? How much is it more difficult? Is it easy? But is it in most respects easier for us to make this case now than it would have been in the 80s or 90s? Um, I wonder, I mean, Nadia, do you have a sense of has there been a similar change, like a similar change in discourse? Are there more opportunities for you now in Belgium 
than there would have been had you been making these arguments in the 80s and 90s, had you been making these arguments a generation ago? Mm -hmm. I think it's really, it depends on the case. Um, the, the, the first, um, you know, good uh, new urban planning, new city, maybe new, a new neighborhood in, in Belgium, uh, was built at the big, um, at the end of the 90s, so Ullebruch, uh, close to the coast. And there is none other example. I mean, one street in Brussels, but it's very few. So still today, it's very difficult. Um, but it's some, yeah, some people would say architecture is not, I mean, there is no link between architecture and politics. But I mean, we see that some parties are more interested uh, into um, heritage and architecture than others. So those that will come to us and and try to find arguments, um, discussion, you know, solution. Uh, but then it's really the beginning. And and so now we are working more in the you know on sites, but that's in France, where I think there is um, for the future maybe it's going to be uh, easier. And also Belgium is a bit bit complicated, and you don't you know that Samuel because of the region, um, right. the Flemish part and the the French part they work completely differently. So we used to be in Brussels and now we are in Bruges. And for example, in Bruges, um, the municipality understands, you know, the um, heritage and beauty much more. You know, if, if we talk about um, when we talk with them about beauty, it's something we don't have to argument on it. It's just intuitive. It's something it's just, you know, um, it's there and some people can explain it and others would say it's just aesthetic, but I think it's much more. Um, and and when we were in Brussels, it, it was impossible. I mean, to talk about beauty, um, some people understand it, but you know, uh, if you want to pass the the barrier of uh, politics, and I mean, as as Great Street did in in UK, you need to have like some um, some people uh, behind you. So in in France, it's working now, but again, it's really depending on the case. So some city. Some region of France, they are uh -huh. uh, really keen on that, keen to 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 change, keen to bring back um, um, embellishments. And would, would talk also about beautification um, back in their uh, lives, uh, and they understand why it is so important. Um, but I think it may, I mean, for my generation, yes, of course, it's much more easy to work and to to talk about that. And, and thank you, thank, thanks to the, the whole, you know, pe the whole architect, urbanist and terrorist that came before me, uh, that I found when I was uh, studying and they changed my life and they changed the life of many, many others. Uh, so yes, I, I'm, I think since the 1980s, it changed a lot, but I would say more in education and less, less on site. So I, because I, that, Oh, there is more and more, you know, summer school, for example. So it's th that that's really great, and that's um, I think for the future, it's uh, lots of hope uh, because we see that through the, the world, there is new schools that are raising, and new school mean new architect, new urbanist, you know, new thinker who will also design in the future. Um, I mean, th this is something that happened in UK. There, there was school. And, and from those school, new architect and new urbanist came. And then now we see, we see the results in UK, which is, you know, for us, a, an example. So paradoxically, I mean, I know that Kobe runs this Twitter account where he posts, you post every day, right, Kobe? You find a, a really good development <laughs> that you've, that's just recent and is a, a not necessarily perfect, but is an exemplar in some way. So that means, maybe you'll run out eventually, but that means you've got like a pool of thousands that you can draw on. That would be tough to do, tough to do in England, tough to do in Belgium. So maybe paradoxically, at least in some respects, um, yeah, you're at an advantage in the United States, as opposed to, to even in France or Belgium, where there's a vast wealth of 18th and 19th century vernacular architecture to draw on, because you've got a more active uh, market for some of this um, in, in recent work. Can I add one quick thing, actually, just quickly before Kobe responds, just coming back to what Nadia said, just to, to feed into Kobe's. Um, I, I think the reason it's easier, because I think it is easier now than it was a generation ago, is is, is partly exactly what you just said, Samuel. And uh, the, the, But also, I think, with some of the bigger new new urbanist developments, you know, the, the Brand of Woods, the Plessy Robinson, the Poundbury in England, you know, there are examples which 
you know, the money men can look at and say, this is worth more. I mean, there's, there's no debate about it. They're, they're very clearly successful developments as developments purely commercially. So I think that's one reason why I think the case for traditional urbanism, which looks nice and you want to walk around, is is, is easier to make. We, we've literally got evidence that was not there 30 years ago, uh, or even 20 years ago or 10 years ago to the same degree. And secondly, I think slightly paradoxically, um, the, the the intellectual case for new urbanism, not, I think, always that well-funded, founded uh, in, empirically to start with, though it is well founded, I think, ultimately, you know, has been being made now for 20 or 30 years and I think has become quite acceptable, e- even in uh, modernist circles who might reject uh, you know, vernacular in, in inverted commas uh, facade patterns. They do accept the case for walkable urbanism because they, the evidence that it is more sustainable and you need cars less, I think, is, is just so overwhelming. So I think a combination, if you like, of intellectual, financial and other evidence means that some key bits of the the case that needs to be made are are very very firmly or culturally in place in a way that they just weren't i think a generation ago sorry i didn't mean to cut across your question to kobe i just thought i'll just expand that is an excellent answer no that 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 is perfectly all right and and i was just going to to, to throw uh one one or two lines in there and then i was just curious i know ruben's talked about this extensively uh it kind of these these market signals uh on on his podcast but it's right and, and you kind of have to put on a Janus face as a developer. Um, I, I'm not today doing strictly uh, neo-traditional work, though I, I would love to aspire to do more projects like that. The Southern California context we work in is, is a little, um, calls for something a little different. But I think the the fundamental brand of good urbanism uh, has has permeated the broader discourse such that um, there there is at once a premium for being in, in walkable places, but also, Nicholas, to your point, uh, it is just a common sense um, uh, measure that these places are, are, are far more uh, economically viable, sustainable, whatever metric you, you want to employ. Uh, and so it, the argument sort of came from a place of, well, look, the market is telling us um, I'd rather live in the West Village in New York. I'd rather live in DuPont Circle in DC than perhaps these, these outer lying areas. Uh, and there's there's proximity uh, reasons for, the, for that as well. Um, but these places are fundamentally lovely. And in the US, that language is sometimes used, the, the, the academic language is sometimes used incorrectly in general parlance. And I think that's good. I think if if people generally ascribe anything that uh, feels good and is relatively new as new urbanism, it might not be by the book, new urbanism or, or new urbanist projects. But if, if it's a way for people to understand uh, the recent advances and throw it in that pool, that's good. And I think in the US, that's that's really manifested in walkability, um, where, where folks will say, oh, this is a walkable project, and I like that. Um, and, and that's kind of our first uh, battle that, we, that we, we've gotten to. Less to beauty, uh, but I think if we can explain through, uh, certainly the studies that, that you've done at Create Streets, uh, that there's empirical reasons why we should uh, shape our cities in certain ways, then we can uh, make make the the further arguments on the value of aesthetics beyond there. Thank you very much. It's very powerful. Um, only other thing I wanted to ask about, I mean, in terms, we've talked a bit about how the tradition of new urbanism has evolved since the eighties. Who do you think? I suppose maybe I'll go to Ruben here in the first. Place. Who do you think are the uh, the key thinkers and writers who have been most influential? Or who are most relevant now? I mean, if you were to give, you know, your your top reading recommendations yeah. to our listeners, who would they? Um, well, there have been, of course, a lot. Um, uh, so I've had the pleasure in my podcast to speak to a lot of people. Um, so, uh, of course, on the the whole philosophy surrounding the beauty side, uh, there's of course uh, Roger Scruton. I mean, it's hard to evade him in this whole uh, discourse. He made this. Uh, uh, this uh, documentary about it, of course, uh, as well. But uh, yeah, you have so many thinkers. You have Leon Krier, you, uh, you have uh, Andres Duani, uh, and I also have Nir Buras with his uh, Classic Planning uh, um, Institute, which has, well, uh, yeah, that's that's a pretty formidable book with with some, some very useful things there as well. Uh, then, of course, you have... Um, uh, well, uh, Robert Adam, uh, maybe already uh, named him. Um, well, people on this 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 panel, of course, uh, I've learned a lot from from Nicholas uh, because his empirical oh, thank view you. things is <laughs> yeah. You can come mean, again. 
Well, man, yeah, but that's that's a very very important uh, part of the puzzle uh, to show that uh, there's actually evidence supporting and backing all these uh, theories and uh, yeah uh, design elements, backing them up uh, with empirical data. That's extremely important, and it's not happening enough. Also, people like uh, Anne Sussman and uh, 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 yeah uh, her colleague. Uh, doing all this research uh, in neuroscience and eye tracking uh, research. I think that's also something very important has been important to me to, uh, yeah, to make it a bit more tangible as well, uh, because um, I think that um, that to, uh, like this neuro neuroscience research together with, uh, well, almost social research and uh, social geography research uh, the view that Jane Jacobs had on the city, uh, that way of looking at the city, those two combined are extremely powerful to to say like, hey, we see that this is happening and this is working and this is a successful recipe. Why don't we use it? And uh, yeah, uh, looking at um, uh, neighborhoods that have become very uh, successful and uh, attractive in Amsterdam, for example, well, the pipe which is an area which used to be um, more or less ninth, early 19th century, late, or actually no, late 19th century, early 20th century slums almost, uh, but very dense and uh, support a lot of um, uh, facilities. They have gentrified um, and they are now very attractive. And gentrification is, is now, of course, a very negative turn, but you also should see it um, as an indicator of success. If an area is, is gentrifying, that means that it is attractive. And that might sound very controversial, but uh, it is true. And I think that it is such a negative thing is because there is a lack of these kinds of urban environments. So uh, if anything, we should build more of it so there's more supply. So, uh, yeah, there's not like this huge rush of people going to an environment that has been updated or upgraded and has uh, the urban fabric people actually want. Um, so yeah, I think we should, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's <laughs> a bit of a, a detour from, from the, the, the people who have inspired me, but, um, and that's, yeah. that's a point that, uh, that, uh, Yolanda Barnes, who used to be, uh, had big, uh, UK based, uh, you know, professional consultancies, everyone's just frozen. I hope you can all still hear me. Uh, yeah, that's the point she you. used to make exactly that, which is, you know, the problem of gentrification is essentially that it's it's it is focused on certain types of place, uh, and you know if we had more good places, it would be less less extreme in its in its um in its contours. Can I just name two other quick authors I would suggest reading, and perhaps it's a, perhaps a more broader discussion about urbanism. One would be Yang Gel, who I'm sure is known to many of you, um, but he actually has a very uh, interesting. I you know I know him a little bit. Uh, he talks about driving architecture and walking architecture. And I think that's quite a helpful distinction. And, you know, walking architecture is more pleasant to look at. So, you know, he, he touches on, on these issues. And obviously, it's been quite very important in his studies of, of where people go and how they walk and where they want to be. Um, I'd also mention perhaps, perhaps someone who's probably less well known outside the UK that I know Samuel also knows him. Uh, Matthew Carmona, who is a professor of planning at UCL. Um, and I, I, uh, you know, he, he's I, I mean, this is perhaps slightly shocking to say, but he, he is, I, to the best of my knowledge, the only academic in the UK who in the way that I and some of my colleagues at Credit Streets have done, has systematically tried to read the evidence on place and well-being. I mean, lots of others have touched on it, but he's actually sat down and tried to read as much as he can. I'm, I'm genuinely not aware of others. There, there must be others, uh, but but he has done it. And I think he's he, he, um, he, he, he's worth reading. So I've got questions streaming in from the audience here. Um, I will, I think, start with this is one that's come up a few times in different ways. So Callum King asks, during a global cost of living crisis, what are the best arguments that people can be making to politicians and developers to invest in beautification and good design? Um, and that's something that I think we'll be all come up against quite often, very well worth engaging with. Uh, do we want uh, maybe Millie? Would you like to start? I was just about to throw that one back at you, actually, uh, not to answer, but I was just going to paraphrase you because um, we assume that all of these beautiful old buildings, like, you know, the we were talking before this call started about some of these Georgian townhouses, um, and we assume that they're, you know, all built by these monks who, like, mined the clay themselves and have a kiln in the monastery. But um, no, so like uh, the, the scalability, the volume, the, um, <laughs> it's 
sorry. Nicholas is stuck on us. Um, his friend is smiling. Sorry. Nicholas, could you behave yourself? You're, uh... <laughs> um, but a lot of the, those um, elements and bits of ornament and detail and, um, you know, the fabrication aspects of that were volumized. So, so volume building was not new, uh, is not new, and it's possible to do beautiful places affordably. And there are so many examples of that. So Nicholas quickly mentioned Laplessy Robinson. Um, you know, you know, there's um, a torn of grain in Scotland. Um, it is possible to do. One really big factor of, this, of success in that is... Um, land it's stewardship from a, a developer who really cares about it and um you know is is there for the long term um you know you can get better quality if if the person who owns the land or investing in it is happy to stick around a little bit longer so it can be done and it's so much easier than you know if this is not solving climate change it's actually one of those things that you could execute on tomorrow if the you know, policymakers decided they were going to invest in it. It's actually delightfully simple in some ways. Kobe, you're really up against the rock face with some of these, the cool face, I mean, yeah. in some of these questions. If you're, uh, you know, actually making the case for a good standard of, a good standard in a given development that you're working on, how do you make uh, that kind of argument? Yeah, it, everything that Millie has said, I, I completely agree with. Um, I, I think I, I was talking about this yesterday. Um, I had a thread on Twitter and was talking with some folks about it, that the fundamental elements of, of creating and, and costs of creating buildings are not that expensive on a per square foot basis. The, the expense in cities that have uh, affordability crises, which I think is a very important question from Calum, um, comes principally from land. Uh, and, and so how do you, how do you moderate the cost of, of land, you create more supply. And it, it's not as a simple binary that this supply versus demand argument, because there are certainly demand side protections we need for, for tenants who, who are vulnerable. Um, but it, it does tend to be that when you increase the amount of a good that people want, um, and, and such that you can meet the market demand for it, uh, that there will be less expense. Uh, Samuel and I were, were in Charleston a couple of weeks ago, touring some really lovely developments uh, in the city, which I think are among the best in, in North America. And the, the hard and soft costs um, were, were not very expensive to complete these projects. Uh, there was one that we were viewing just outside of Charleston in, in Mount Pleasant um, that was a pretty lovely development. And these homes originally started $250,000. And now just um, less than a decade later, they're, they're well over a million dollars each, a million, 1.2, 1.3. 1 and you see this happening around the country. And there is this inability to reconcile, while these are lovely places, they're inherently expensive. Um, the materials must cost more. There must be monks who are prostrating themselves by hand-fired bricks to be able to realize these places. And when in fact, that's not true. Um, as a developer, the, the oftentimes, certainly in New York and Southern California, in, in some of the contexts I work in, um, it, it, does, it, it costs something certainly to construct the buildings, but our largest hurdle is to it, it are the regulatory and land costs that are imposed. Um, and it's not to say there are, there are no good re regulations. There are many e excellent ones, um, but that's what we have to fight against. And so the, the best way to reduce uh, th that the cost of land so that we get closer to what the replacement costs of these buildings are, um, it is to replicate it such that we're not concentrating um, those few who have privilege to be able to afford wonderful places in small areas. We need to decentralize it so that the, the de facto development pattern that, that folks can be able to, to live in and breathe in and, and, and work and play in um, are wonderful walkable cities. Thank you. Um, a question from Harley. Um, so I am a management trainee at a city council in the West Midlands. What can council officers do to encourage sustainable, attractive development in their local authority areas. We have a couple of other questions in a similar spirit. I think, I mean, Nicholas, you're the one with experience that will most directly speak to this. What would you- Yes, uh... I think I can do that. And I, I apologize, I fell off the call there for a couple of minutes. I don't quite know what happened, but I'm, if I was muted like this, I, I'm sorry, I was trying to, <laughs> I was sitting here saying, why won't my bloody Wi-Fi work? But no, it's working again now, so sorry well, about that. Welcome back, Nicholas. Thank you, thank you. The hamster call's still happening. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, very, very good question. Look, the, the, 
you know, often in life you're, you end up giving uh, the bad news is type answers. I think I can give a, your glasses half full answer to that excellent question, which is that there are now more hooks, as planning lawyers say, in a, a document called the National Planning Policy Framework, which you obviously know what it is, but is the sort of the substatutory document that sets planning policy. Um, so councils are now encouraged to set clearer visual local policy of how streets will work. And there's also good guidance now coming through from manuals for streets and department of transport. So my, my advice would be um, you know, work with officials and councillors and the wider public uh, on an area based uh, basis. I'm setting it spatially you know, for the whole borough district to, to give really clear policy about what is and isn't acceptable. And but don't try and regulate for everything. So re regulate for the things that will matter to how people move around, what a building, what a place looks like, uh, clean air, walkability, trees. There are, and there are good hooks now on trees. So I would I'd move to that, but, but critically base it in evidence, which you can now get online as well as through, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, workshops and, and surveys as to what people like and how they want to see a place develop and what feels like of that place. Because one of the consistent themes that comes through uh, really throughout the UK, and I, I think you can see this elsewhere, is that people feel development is, is done at them and is not of this place. Come back to that word vernacular. Um, and, you know, people are surprisingly sensitive to what round here means. Like even people you might not sort of, in inverted commas, expect to do so are, you know, quite sensitive to the fact that this is Yorkshire, so it's stone. This is Sussex, so it's red brick. This is Cambridgeshire, so it's stock brick or, or whatever it might be. But there you go. So there's a quick answer. I could go on for hours on that. But uh, Creative Streets is happy to help in such matters and do so on very competitive rates. Forgive me. <laughs> Shocking. Um, question from Ruth Fletcher. So I see lots of attractive photos on your Twitter accounts, but I worry that in some cases, quaint beauty is not always accessible. How does your elderly, how do your elderly grandparents visit you if they have to climb a staircase to get to the front door? Where do you keep your bike or mobility scooter or pushchair? How do young children play safely outside without any private enclosed space? And so on and so on. So is that, that the and so on and so on was in the original. <laughs> I haven't interpolated it. The, um, so I think the general question here is, you know, what what how far are there tensions between beautiful design and these other kinds of objectives, in particular here, accessibility? Um, how far are those soluble? I suspect any of the panelists could speak to this. Um, uh, Nadia, would you like to come in? Nadia? No, that is struggling, no, I think. In that case. Sam, I, um, no, we had a great chat with um, Andrew Cameron, um, who was one of the street designers for Pambury. A couple of days ago and so he was telling us um that in Poundbury they do some pretty comprehensive accessibility testing so they get out there with um vision impairment glasses and um you know they test the streets for vision impairment um you know um hazards they you know they do pay attention to where wheelchairs can get in and for me that just illuminates the fact that if you're doing new beautiful places they're actually much easier to design for than adapting an old heritage place because you can you know, um, make sure that they're fit for codes and that they are up to modern standards. Um, and I think another part of your point was um, where will children play safely? And this is one of the, the most important aspects of, I think, what people like us are trying to do. So I think the best place for children to play safely is in a public space, ideally on the street where they're not going to get hit by a car. Um, you know, it's about creating communities that are kind of integrated and um I think one of the words Nicholas uses for it is restitched. That's where we thrive best. That would be my answer. Are you I back, think that... <laughs> Yes, I'm back. Uh, yes, uh. yes. But it's been like a few minutes. I can. I didn't hear anything, so I'm really sorry. Don't worry. We'll come back to you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> if I just add one thing very, very quickly to Millie's perfect answer, I think is, yeah, I think you know, when you've got old buildings, you know, older, old new urbanism, there can be some tensions on access because if they've got narrow, steep staircases, that, that can be problematic. I think there's no point pretending otherwise. The, the great news is that when you're doing new buildings, that, that doesn't need to be so the case. I mean, that there are some tensions, how wide and how shallow are the staircases? How does that fit with the, the, the plot pattern of a, say, five and a half metre wide terrace house? So there are some, some tensions there. 
they are manageable. I mean, we're, we're working on codes right now arranged across the country that manage them. So that's doable. I think access to things like children's play and walkability and ongoing physical health is actually a huge advantage of gentle density. So I think the tension there goes all the other way. I think all the challenges are for, you know, drive to cul-de-sacs or, you know, spending your life going up and down in an elevator for your tiny flat at the end of a corridor. The evidence on how much people walk, how many of their neighbours they know, the ease with which children play outside, I think is is unambiguously and very clearly in favour of beautiful, walkable, uh, gentle density. Uh -huh. The question from Klingon Dekotny. Uh, so are we condemned to be surrounded either by ugly modern buildings uh, and or by ugly modern buildings and beautiful new buildings? So can there be a modern architectural style that is different from previous ones and that is beautiful without being near this, near that, near the other? Um, Kobe, you've worked a lot on this. You want to come in there? Uh, very briefly, and then I'd be, I'd be curious to hear from others. Um, I, I think it is possible. I, I think uh, there is a lot of excellent work being done uh, in this school in the Pacific Northwest, uh, predominantly Portland and Seattle. And so I'm, I'm happy to share any projects um, with, with other folks who might be interested in seeing them um, that certainly are modernist, certainly aren't uh, neo-traditional, but I think they're, they're, they're very lovely. Um, I, I don't know exactly how you would describe them, but they are uh, st strikingly contemporary, yet they still feel comfortable and they adhere to some pretty baseline good, good foundations. Ruben. Similar to you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I believe that, um, well, I, I already uh, responded partly in chat, but I, I think uh, to expand on that point, I think, um, okay, okay, with the limitations of building technique, because of course, like if you get a pointed arch uh, in, yeah, Gothic, uh, Gothic architecture, that's partly building technique, but it is also style, you could say. So um, um, considering building techniques, um, yeah, I think there is, yeah, but looking at colors, but also patterns you could include, um, yeah, how how elongated shapes are. I think there's a very, very wide range of new uh, innovations we could theoretically um, still have in style, um, working with um, new technologies like 3D printing or as, um, uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Bart uh, already said, um, using AI even to uh, yeah to generate new types of architecture that might we, we might not even be capable of thinking of but still adhering to certain proportions and um, uh, yeah fractals other elements that please the eye uh, from a psychology standpoint I mean we could even uh, theoretically and this is just fun to think about uh, using computer algorithms and uh, perhaps data from uh, eye tracking and other uh, uh, influence perhaps we could even do it with with ECG stand uh, ECG scans develop like a bliss point uh, in architecture where like architecture that is optimally uh, just optimized extremely to to uh, human preferences uh, which might be um, yeah innate uh, but this this is just a theoretical uh, expansion and uh, like they are now yeah doing with foods like crisps and stuff they are engineered to the max uh, to the bliss point where people where most people will find it extremely tasty this might be done as well for architecture but there's just um, um so some speculative ideas about it so in theory yeah or in practice um yeah i think there's still a lot we can do i, I, can can I, I make one really really sorry, quick point minutes. for like two seconds don't I don't think about this as like what looks good now or what um, is even going to look good in twenty years. For me, it's it's all about what still looks good in a hundred years. And a great thought experiment is to go back and like find an architectural drawing, like a poster for something done in nineteen seventy, and how cool and new and novel and fresh it looked. Has it aged well? What will actually age well and be timeless? I think a lot of the stuff coming out now, like it has the freshness of novelty, but there's, there's, yeah, timelessness, yeah. <laughs> Nadia, I think I saw a hand. Yes, yes. Um, I think talking about style is maybe not, you know, the best way to talk about architecture or urban planning. Um, somehow I think there is like, you know, universal principle that can be 
uh, adapt to different climates, you know, things that work. And for example, here in Bruges, you know, I see that uh, we have buildings since, uh, I mean, uh, roots of buildings since the 15th century, a bit before. Uh, but the typology, they haven't changed a lot. I mean, what has changed is that some details have been ameliorated, some materials have been developed, but with the same, the same es uh, essence, the same, yeah, you understand yeah, what essence, I mean? Yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, change, change is always in continuity. It, it, it follows, you know, rules, experience, and, and that's why architecture is not only aesthetic, it's, of course, uh, construction and if things are well built they will age well um, and construction then is linked to aesthetic with ornamentation uh, details and all those things and that's that's why i think you know anyway you know if we keep those principles if we still use those materials in the good way you know not just just like a veneer on a facade but if we use them well you know as they as they they still work you know in many old buildings uh, we will, of course, maybe it's going to take 50 years, maybe a century, but we will somehow find, you know, a new way to express our ornamentation. Um, I think, you know, it's, uh, but the, the I, I, I really believe that the, the typology, the, the essence of architecture will never change. I mean, it has changed with modernism. Of course, there is a rupture, but for me, that's not architecture. It's, it's, uh, it's more, it's, 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 it's it's seeing like you know uh, something as an object, and architect our architecture is much more. It's it's always related to the parts around, to the the building around. It's it's not arrogant. It's very uh, humble. Um, and if we want something that is durable, I think we really need to learn back all those very very good principles that have been used for centuries um, and more, um, and and use them again, and maybe you know, adapt them sometimes if needed, and we will find, you know, our ways uh, to something beautiful again. I mean, I'm sure we can do that, but I'm, I'm, I mean, that's my point. I don't think that, you know, uh, advanced technology will help us. I think our mind and our hands are the our best, you know, hope for that, for a good architecture, um, because we have to think, you know, um, if we want to do something good and we want to use the experience of the past, we have to somehow think and understand how they think, you know, in the past and why they, what they, why they did that for centuries, why they use those techniques for centuries. Um, and we can only do that, you know, um, somehow by ourselves. And, and we are human. So we, we want this architecture also to stay human, uh, and to keep the creativity of the, the human kind. So, yeah. Thank you. We are getting quite a few questions about education. Um, so I'll compress them into one. But you know, how can we transmit more of these ideas to education? How can an, a new generation of architects and urban designers, I guess, especially outside the United States, but um, how can they be uh, trained to be able to draw on this tradition or to work in these traditions? Um, Nadia, you're of all of us the one who has the most experience on the uh, on the education side of things. What's what's been your experience with um, working with young people, with running summer schools, with trying to well, clearly with succeeding and attracting interest in in learning about these kinds mm -hmm. of skills? So, um, it really depends on the people because we have a mix of students, um, and I think this is the case for most summer school of different backgrounds. Um, I mean, for on our part in Belgium, we see that most people who want to learn, you know, um, good architecture, beautiful architecture, they want to practice, they want to do something they don't do at university or they don't do at work. So I would say it's drawing or really building something. So um, using your hands. Um, and so also going back to an education that is you know, based on practice, that that is really something that we are trying to develop. Um, and and then, yeah, I think there is a lot of lack of uh, architecture history in, in architecture school, Any anything also um, art school. So this is something also we, we try to um, to teach as much as possible, like construction. Construction is really something that's young people love. I think it's, you know, 
uh, they are missing that at university. So when they come to us and, you know, they can learn about carpentry or stone, stone masonry or, you know, anything that is really related to natural materials and that's, you know, a building that have aged like uh, centuries, they are very interested and, and they always ask if they can, you know, if they will be somehow one day be able to build. So uh, what I'm saying is that, um, I think the, the first school in Europe that will raise, like real school, not summer school, that will raise, it would be very, very helpful if somehow it can, you know, um, mix as it did in the, in the past, uh, crafts and architecture. So theory and practice. Um, so maybe craftsmen and architect, they will learn together. And I think that's a very good opportunity for us today to, to find ways that, um, the architecture uh, practice is much more holistic and not, you know, too specialized just on computer drawing and going on site once every three months. Um, I think it's much more than that. And we, I mean, if you really work with craftsmen uh, as an architect, uh, uh, things that 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 I do, uh, I I would I I will I would like to do that uh, more. But when I do it, you understand that at the end. Uh, it's like a, it's a sharing, you know, um, design. It's not something, it's not the architect's uh, work. So I think it's, th this is very important is that the ed education come back to practice, um, to construction, to understand that all those elements, ornamentation, composition, they, they are linked to, to lots of different crafts. Uh, that work together, they know so many things. Uh, so also when we do, so education, if education has to change, Teacher, they must be architect, but they also must be builders, uh, urbanists, and and historians. Um, but it 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 shouldn't be too specialized, I think. But for what it's so, worth, and I'm conscious we're running out of time, but I I I, mean, I I gave a couple of lectures at Nadia's brilliant summer school this summer. I was incredibly moved and actually very uplifted and encouraged beyond encouraged. I mean, so sort of deeply, deeply moved. Uh, by the, the the desire and the need that some of Nadia's students had to to create good, beautiful, sustainable places, um, and I totally echo what Nadia was just saying. Like, you know, I, I'm not, maybe it could be create streets. Maybe we'll get there first. But you know, at some stage in the next two to three years, there will be, I have no doubt, some big plays in Europe. I think hopefully in the UK, but it doesn't matter if not to to start creating you know properly, uh, you know, traditional in inverted commas with a small T. Uh, design and creation schools. I think probably they won't come from within the existing architectural schools. I think it's quite hard for them to change tack. I, I think some of them will follow a few years later. And, and I agree. I, I have just no doubt that the desire is there. I'm hoping that that requirement that's growing now in the UK planning system, the English planning system, that places be, be able to show that they're popular. I think that's the way to cut through a lot of this debate uh, so that developers and landowners are forced to think of what the types of places in which people wish to be and forced to engage with the evidence on that uh, a cautiously optimistic note um, i've got hands going up in the panel and questions streaming in from the audience but i undertook to end this quite strictly on time and have already failed to do so um, so i am now going to bring us to a close uh, it just remains to me to thank all of you for a fantastic conversation to thank create streets for hosting this um, and to say how much i shall look forward to you know, future discussions to keep this going Samuel, thank you very much, and thank you all for playing part. And uh, thank you to my my co my co panelists. And thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for having Thanks, me. Thanks, guys. Probably See you later. Bye, everyone.